Okay, this week, um, let's see if I can record a video that's not super long and super convoluted. Seems unlikely. Um, we were looking at the heart last week, you know, the basics of the heart, and I was talking to some students about this, that and the other, and we were working our way down the aorta, and I thought, that's a good idea. We should start at the heart and then follow the aorta, that huge, really important blood vessel, as it goes through the thorax and down through the abdomen and see how it ends, but we'll talk about all the branches as we go down. And then after that, we can talk about the things that go wrong with the aorta, which if you have problems with your aorta, Funnily enough, they start off as not symptomatic at all, but when it fails, it's catastrophic. Okay, then let's take you apart. One thing to notice before we take them apart, um, so here's the manubrium, here's the sternum, here's the xiphoid process. Now the joint between the manubrium and the sternum is the sternal angle, and that also identifies uh, the angle of Louis, or the plane of the angle of Louis, um, which runs from there across to the intervertebral disc between T4 and T5. Um, so the level across here is quite interesting anatomically for things that cross through it. We have the carina of the um, trachea, but we also have the start and finish of the arch of the aorta. So we'll look at the arch of the aorta in a minute, but if we find the second rib, so you can do this on someone, you see, you, you can palpate your sternum and where you feel that ridge there, lateral to that, that is where the second rib is. You can't find the first rib because look, it's hidden by the clavicle. So you can't find the first rib and count from it really. You find the second rib and you work down from there, that's easiest. So where the second rib meets the sternum, posterior to that we find the start of the arch of the aorta, whoop, and it loops around, and then it ends more posteriorly, but pretty much around um, where the left second rib meets the sternum. Anyway, let's, let's take you apart and see what we got. Pop your head back on. Got an open day this weekend, so we've got um, we've students in the lab study, and we've got stuff set up for the open day. Um, so yeah, I'm finding a little space in the lab for myself. Right, okay, here we go. Um, the heart. When we looked inside the heart, well, this one does come apart. There we go. So really, if we're talking about the aorta, the aorta is this massive, great big blood vessel that is responsible for taking blood from the heart and sending it off around the entire body, except for the lungs. Um, which is why it's so big and why it's quite special. And when we dissect um, people, we do find that this aorta is huge. And um, usually it's a very elastic um, artery, which we'll talk about as well. But often in the older people that have donated their bodies to us to examine, we find that the aorta has become um, much firmer. And it's not just through fixation, it's, it's through age. So my aorta is probably not as stretchy and springy as it used to be. But we we see the, the left ventricle here, and then we were looking under there, and we saw the, the semilunar valve, of, or the aortic valve. And it's called semilunar because, in fact, the, each of the cusps is kind of a half-moon-shaped bag. So the, the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood up through the aorta, and then as it relaxes and the blood gets pulled back again, those half-moon semilunar sacs fill with blood, and the three of them pop against each other um, and they stop the blood going back into the left ventricle normally. Um, now the interesting thing to start with then, so this part of the aorta here, and note how it spirals around the pulmonary trunk, it's beautiful that, and there's some good embryology behind that. Um, but these two, the, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta spiral around each other as they, as they come out of the, the heart. and right above those semilunar valves. So this is the ascending aorta here in the thorax, this first part so then is, is just above those semilunar valves. And we have left and two of the valves, two, sorry, these semilunar, two of the cusps of the semilunar valves, um, the left and the right ones, are also where we find the right and left coronary arteries starting from. So this is the right side of the heart. So Above the right um, cusp of the aortic valve, there's a hole there, 
and then the right coronary artery comes off that and runs around the heart like a crown, which is where the word coronary comes from. And then the left coronary artery um, comes out of a hole from the aorta um, above the, the left cusp. Those spaces that the coronary arteries come out of we call uh, sinuses, aortic sinuses, used to be called uh, the sinuses of Valsalva. So the left aortic sinus is where the left coronary artery comes from, which means that the coronary arteries, the left and right coronary arteries, are the first branches from the aorta, and the, this great vessel has barely left the heart. Um, so those two come out of the ascending aorta right there, which means that any pathology in this region affecting the aorta is likely to affect the coronary arteries, and that's terrible news because if you if you affect the blood going through a coronary artery, then you affect the blood supply to a major part of the heart, which is not a good thing, right? Ischemia to the muscle, heart attack, yeah, all that sort of thing. As I was saying earlier, this then is the ascending aorta, and then very quickly it becomes the arch of the aorta. And the aorta arches posteriorly and to the left side of the body. And, oh, why have I picked this model? <sighs> Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get another model. Normally, from the arch of the aorta, we see three characteristic branches. And we see the brachiocephalic trunk going off to the right here, which is kind of balancing off the fact that the arch of the aorta is going to the left. The brachiocephalic trunk passes to the right and splits into the, the right subclavian artery, which is gonna supply blood to the right upper limb, and to the becomes the right common carotid artery, which is gonna supply blood to the neck and the head on the right. Now, the next two branches, the second branch then of the arch, on the arch of the aorta is the left common carotid artery. And normally you see that very distinctively. You normally see two, but we just see one kind of mass here, which is, which is you know, skip over that. Uh, let me just swap that for another one. Let's try this one. And here you can see what we normally see, like one, two, three branches. I like the other model because we can see the aorta pretty much on its own. We can see a lot more branches. It's, lo it's a lot more complete as far as the aorta is con concerned. If we take the heart away, you know, it's, it's, the aorta is there, but it's a bit covered up. Anyway, so we see the brachiocephalic trunk, uh, the left common carotid artery, and then this third big branch is the left subclavian artery, which is going to go off to the left, sub the clavicle, and then go to the left upper limb and supply blood to that. And the arch of the aorta then continues arching over to the left and posteriorly. And when it ends, it descends through the uh, thorax as the descending or thoracic aorta or descending thoracic aorta, something like that. It's quite important to be clear because if you cut a section through at this level here, you'll see the aorta twice. So if you're looking at an MRI scan or a CT scan of the thorax, cutting a transverse section, um, you know, just a little superiorly to the heart, you'll see the ascending aorta and the descending aorta. Very important. Well, I'm gonna go back to the other model now. Right. So here we can see the aorta arching to the left and posteriorly. Let me take this lung out. Okay, now if I, we can see there's the arch of the aorta and then there's the descending aorta in there, all right? I'm gonna take the other lung out so I can play with the diaphragm. So one thing to notice is how the esophagus is tightly associated with the aorta. See, again, they wrap around each other a little bit, but the two are related, and they're related to the point that um, from the aorta, supplying blood to this section of the esophagus. So there's a bunch of esophageal arteries here, and they are a little bit variable in number. There may be four or five in, in your thorax. The big one, though, is, you can see in there, is, of course, that there are many, many branches coming from the aorta and uh, running out between the ribs, and those are the intercostal arteries. So there are lots of intercostal arteries um, running down here, bum, 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 bum. Lots and lots of, so these are paired lateral branches. These are an indication of uh, us being a segmented animal. And we see this pattern as we continue down to the abdomen. Um, they're called intercostal arteries when they're between the ribs, and the very last pair are called subcostal arteries, just because then they're, they're running beneath the ribs, they're subcostal, right? If I take the heart out, there's something else here. 
<clears throat> between the arch of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk in the adult we see this this is the ligamentum arteriosum this is a remnant of the ductus arteriosus which in the fetus was a method of instead of sending blood out of the pulmonary trunk and into the lungs the blood could go straight through the ductus arteriosus and into the arch of the aorta and then off around the body in the fetus the lungs are not well developed they do not have a great blood supply so much of the blood in the fetus avoids going to the lungs and instead takes a number of shortcuts and this is one of them the ductus arteriosus we find that ligamentum arteriosum at the arch of the aorta between the arch of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk so as well as these paired intercostal arteries, um, there are bronchial arteries. There are left and right bronchial arteries. So if the pulmonary arteries supply a huge amount of blood to the lungs, their purpose is to take blood to the lungs for gaseous exchange. The bronchial arteries are supplying blood to kind of like the, 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 the tissues of the lungs themselves. They're much smaller. They follow the, um, the airways, the bronchial tree, and they're, they're supplying blood to the parenchyma, the connective tissue, the bronchial tree itself. Do you see what I mean? So two different functions. And the bronchial arteries are often branches of the aorta, although often um, the right bronchial arteries are branches from an intercostal artery rather than from the aorta themselves but bronchial arteries come from the arch of the aorta there are also some little mediastinal arteries so we're in the posterior mediastinum or mediastinum um, and there are some little arteries there supplying blood again to the lymph nodes and tissues of the posterior mediastinum but they're little little branches there but as we follow the uh, the uh, aorta down to the this large structure here this is the the diaphragm the final branches kind of down there with the subcostal branches that the aorta the thoracic descending aorta gives off are superior phrenic arteries phrenic referring to the diaphragm the seat of the soul um, and the, the superior phrenic arteries then supply blood to the diaphragm and where we have the heart the heart is surrounded by the pericardium and there's not a lot of space between the heart and the pericardium and the aorta so there are also some pericardial branches from the descending thoracic aorta that just run a little way anteriorly and supply blood to the pericardium the connective tissues encasing the heart so as we get down to the diaphragm what can we see here well if we look at the diaphragm there's a hole for the esophagus to go through but there's no hole for the aorta there's a gap at the back so the crura so like um, two, you know, ligamentous things, tendinous, straight, tendinous things, crura, crura is just the right word for them. Um, they, they anchor the, um, the diaphragm to the posterior wall and the, the aorta runs through that gap. This means that movements of the diaphragm shouldn't affect flow of blood through the aorta. Um, once the aorta is passed through the diaphragm it then becomes the abdominal aorta um, and while we're talking about the diaphragm then the first first probably the first branches from the abdominal aorta are the inferior phrenic arteries which are then again supplying blood to the to the diaphragm from the undersurface um, there are three anterior branches um, from the uh, abdominal aorta which we always talk about when we're talking about the gastrointestinal system the first one is the celiac trunk sometimes those inferior phrenic arteries come off the celiac trunk we'll have a look at the celiac trunk in a moment but I've got to disembowel further um, stomach Whoa. okay look that's a nice clear dissection so the heart sits up here Whoop. there I've taken the diaphragm away but here's the descending thoracic aorta. There are the crura of the diaphragm. So down here, we have then the abdominal thoracic aorta. So th those three anterior branches from the abdominal aorta then are supplying blood to the gastrointestinal system. Here's the celiac trunk up here. Um, and you can see how it's right underneath the crura. So then as soon as the abdominal aorta appears from under the diaphragm, the celiac trunk comes off. We, we say the celiac trunk supplies blood to the foregut. And the foregut, um, embryologically speaking, is um, 
kind of that, that lower, in this case, is the lower third of the esophagus, uh, the stomach, and the duodenum as far as the duodenal, that, that papilla, that major duodenal papilla, right? The second anterior branch then is the superior mesenteric artery. Um, you can see how that's related to the mesenteries of the small intestine. So the superior mesenteric artery is then supplying blood to the midgut, which in fact is from that major duodenal pillar of the duodenum, uh, the entire small intestine, and then the large intestine, cecum, ascending colon, and then the transverse colon to about two thirds of the way along. And then the more inferior branch, that's the inferior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery then is supplying blood to the remainder of the GI tract, the hindgut, which is that last part of the transverse colon, the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and then upper part of the anal canal. So celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, and inferior mesenteric artery. Um, we can obviously see two other branches here. Um, so we have the kidneys on either side. So these large, large arteries are the left and right renal arteries supplying blood to the kidneys. The kidneys, of course, see a lot of blood for a similar reason to the lungs. The kidneys are processing that blood rather than needing that blood for their own tissues and cells. So they see a lot of blood. Now, just superior to each kidney, we have the suprarenal glands, also called the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands and suprarenal glands, so they have lots and lots and lots and lots of branches. Um, they are hugely important to homeostasis. They chuck out a load of hormones and all sorts. So it's really important that those things are, have got a good blood supply again, functionally. Um, they're the guys that also dump adrenaline into your bloodstream. Um, so there are a lot of branches. They may, the suprarenal glands may get some branches directly from the aorta. They will get some branches from the renal arteries and, and all sorts around there. Now the other, oh blimey, how did that ureter get down there? That's not where the ureter goes. Um, seems to have lost lost the reproductive system as well. The other paired lateral arteries that we're missing are the gonadal arteries. Whether this would be um, a male or a female abdomen and pelvis, the gonadal arteries, um, ovarian arteries in the female, testicular arteries in the male, um, again they they are lateral branches from the aorta that then descend to the gonads. Um, you may have come across the embryology of the gonads. They start to develop in the posterior abdominal wall and they descend to their final position, which completely explains the layers of the scrotum in the male. The other ones you can see on here, so just like the segmental arteries in the descending thoracic aorta, in the abdominal aorta we see these guys, and these are the, the lumbar branches. We have these lumbar branches here running posteriorly. So we've got blood supply going to all of the structures around here. There's a lot of tissues that need a lot of blood, right? So those are the paired lumbar branches. And that's it. Um, we, find, we, we find the end of the aorta here, and the aorta ends as it bifurcates into the two common iliac arteries. We're studying anatomy here, so don't just say iliac artery. This is the left common iliac artery, and it's going to split into the left internal and left external iliac arteries. We have this language for a reason, it's so that we can be precise. Um, so the two common iliac arteries are the end of the aorta, so that's it. Followed the aorta through and looked at all of its branches. I may have missed something out. So the aorta begins um, at the angle of Louis, it passes through the diaphragm at about the level of the um, T12 vertebra, and then it ends here at about the level of the L4 vertebra. So a bit of surface anatomy to apply to it. So that's the aorta and all of its branches. Now, why is the aorta so important? Well, it is a massive blood vessel. It's supplying blood to pretty much the entire body. I mean, down here we're going to supply to the lower limbs and the pelvis, and up here we supply blood to the abdomen, um, head, neck, all sorts, right? Um, now, the, the aorta has three layers to it. So it's a, it's a muscular artery, but it's also pretty elastic. elastic. It has a tunica intima, a tunica media, and a tunica adventitia or tunica externa, I think it gets called. The intima is um, largely endothelium, like any other uh, blood vessel. Um, the tunica media is not just uh, full of smooth muscle and a muscular layer, but it's also very, very elastic. 
Um, and the advent tissue is supportive connective tissue and also I think a little elastic. It has to be, it must be. Because when the left ventricle contracts to push blood out through the aorta, um, there's you know a, a rapid rise in pressure and then a drop off in pressure. So the, the pressure is rising and falling um, as the blood is pushed into the aorta. Now because the aorta can stretch, it means it can dampen that effect a little bit. So the aorta stretches, when the pressure is high, and then as the ventricles are relaxing, the aorta returns to its normal shape. There's no muscular effort required here. So that dampens the pulsatile force of blood coming out of the left ventricle, but also it, it, it makes the flow of blood around the body a little bit more efficient, right? So when the left ventricle is relaxing, um, the aorta is also shrinking and pushing blood around the body. Do you see? Um, and this is great in younger people, but as we get older, particularly also dependent upon our, uh, our lifestyle habits, you know, smoking and diet and that sort of thing, that elastic nature of the aorta gets lost and the aorta starts to uh, become firmer and harder. Uh, so it's less elastic. So those functions um, are less good, <laughs> which, which can have an effect on blood pressure. So what can go wrong with the aorta then, this huge great big blood vessel? Well, you can imagine if, if anything serious goes wrong with this blood vessel, it's going to be serious. The um, most famous, most, I don't know, um, one thing that can occur is an aortic aneurysm. So an aneurysm of a blood vessel is um, when that blood vessel stretches. So usually those, those layers, there's um, a weakness there somewhere, so the, 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 the blood vessel expands and stretches, so we get a bulge. That's most common in the abdominal aorta. Um, there are fewer elastic fibers in there, I think. I think it's less, it's not as tough as in the arch and the descending thoracic aorta. So an aortic aneurysm is a, is a stretching of the aorta, and it may be completely asymptomatic, and the aneurysm itself is not a problem. The problem is, of course, that that weakness and that aneurysm means that um, the aorta might rupture, and that is catastrophic. Also, um, I'm sure you've heard of atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, again, can affect many arteries, but it will affect the um, aorta. Now, atherosclerosis in itself is a it's a fairly complicated disease, but if we stick with the idea that um, you see a plaque um, forming within the lumen of the aorta, um, the problem here is not so much a narrowing of the aorta because it often adapts, and most arteries will adapt to keep the lumen size the same, um, but that plaque itself can rupture or can um, be damaged. Um, and it's often a site where blood clots form. And we don't want blood clots forming within our arteries. That's not where they're supposed to form. They're supposed to form in response to wound healing. Now, if you get blood clots forming in the aorta, well, this is particularly bad, isn't it? Because we've got, we've been looking at the flow of blood from the aorta, which means that if, for example, you were to have a clot of blood forming up here in the, the ascending aorta, um, from an atherosclerotic plaque up here. Well, if it was really low down, that could go into a coronary artery and occlude the coronary artery and blood flow to the heart. If it's a little bit higher, well, it can whoosh off into one of these large blood vessels. And if you think about the circle of Willis and the, um, the direction of flow, um, the common carotid arteries go straight up. They continue as the internal carotid arteries, which go up into the, inside the cranium. Then they continue as the middle cerebral arteries, which is why the, um, the typical characteristics of stroke are the typical characteristics of stroke, because a clot tends to affect most commonly the middle cerebral artery, which supplies blood to the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex. So we see paralysis of the body and loss of sensation on the other side. So clots forming in the aorta can be absolutely catastrophic. Um, but of course, if it forms anywhere in the aorta, then it's gonna flow down, it could, it could occlude a renal artery, it could occlude one of those arteries supplying blood to the GI tract, which would give, give ischemia to a region of the GI tract, all, all terrible, terrible things. So atherosclerosis of the aorta, you know, is, is a problem um, because it's such a central artery. Also, that damage to the intima, to the endothelium from the atherosclerotic plaque, 
um, can weaken the linings of the aorta and lead to aneurysm. Um, so we're back to aneurysm again from related to atherosclerosis, all bad things. The other thing that can occur is um, aortic dissection. Now thinking about those, those layers of the, of the aorta, um, if the intima is broken, is torn, is weakened, then the flow of blood can get between the, the, the tunica intima and the tunica media and separate those two layers. And that's an aortic dissection. Um, and that's a big problem. Um, now an aortic dissection and rupture of the aorta are both associated with sudden onset, massive, massive pain, like the worst pain in the chest, maybe in the back. And as, as the dissection continues, it, you know, it may, it, it may the, where the pain is may extend. Uh, and this is a, a medical and surgical emergency, it has a massive, has a really high mortality rate. Um, they're very, very difficult to be repaired. They can be repaired. There are lots and lots of side effects. Um, but you can imagine if you rupture the aorta, then all of that blood in the aorta is, is leaking into thoracic abdominal spaces. And it's just, it's just awful. Um, aortic dissection, again, because you're separating those two layers, you're weakening, weakening the aorta. Um, and if you have an aortic dissection, then that's very likely to lead to aortic rupture at some point. And as I said at the beginning, because the coronary arteries are coming out of that first part of the ascending aorta, um, valvular disease, valve replacement, things like that make it somewhat likely that aortic dissection might occur in the very first part of the aorta. And if you get dissection there, then there's a risk of um, occluding um, a coronary artery. Something else we see up here, um, which is um, uh, a thing we see in kiddies, and it's a, you know, a congenital defect, is coarctation of the aorta. And that's a narrowing of the aorta, so it's a developmental defect. It's usually in the arch of the aorta, it's pretty much always in the arch of the aorta. It's usually around where the um, ductus arteriosus empties into the arch of the aorta. Uh, and it's a narrowing of the aorta to varying degrees. Um, if the narrowing is, you know, a little, then it means the left ventricle has to work harder uh, than it should. So initially this might be largely asymptomatic, but with time uh, it may give changes to the left ventricle and cause other problems. Um, or it might be fine, it might not cause any problems. Um, but a very, very um, severe coarctation of the aorta means that you're limiting blood flow to pretty much the entire body beyond the arch of the aorta. So it's a pretty serious thing. Um, and most of these things I've been talking about can be fixed surgically to some degree. Um, but the diseases of the aorta uh, tend to be asymptomatic until, until there's a catastrophic failure. Um, and, then it's, um, and then it's rather difficult to fix. This is what's meant by looking after your cardiovascular system. It's, it's, these aren't hypotheticals that we're dealing with. These are actual horrible things that happen um, because we haven't looked after ourselves and also because we're, we're living a lot longer than we used to and we're not getting killed by things that we used to get killed by. So aerobic exercise, eating well, watching your diet, following the latest advice, that sort of thing. Um, and consider your aorta. It's a really big, really important blood vessel. Maybe in the future we'll be able to keep an eye on our aorta with some magic scanning device at home, you know. But at the moment, you're looking at MR, um, L, and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's the anatomy of the human aorta. Um, we've looked at it from start to finish. We've included some surface anatomy landmarks. Um, we've looked at all the branches that come from it. Um, and we've talked about some of the things that can go wrong. It is a very important blood vessel. So hopefully that was useful. Cool, right, see you guys next time.